Faith under fire. Uh, you remember in, in uh, 605 B.C., Daniel, he's one of the young men. Daniel and three of his friends, they get taken off into Babylonian captivity. This is the first of the deportations. You had deportation 605, 597, 587. So you have Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're taken captive during that first deportation. And their Babylonian captors, of course, gave them new names. And Daniel becomes Belteshazzar, and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah become Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Very famous names. And in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's troubled by dreams, and it seems to be one dream that he has repeatedly, because it's re referred to in plural, and then you see he's talking about a dream. But he's troubled by a dream, and he wants the magicians and the astrologers to tell him what the dream means. And they say, okay, you know, we'll do that. That's fine with us. You tell us the dream, and we'll tell you what it means. <laughs> and he's not going for it. And he says, no, I got, I got another idea for you. You're going to tell me both the dream and what it means. Well, when he says that, you know, they start grousing about that and com complaining about it. And so then he issues a decree that they all be put to death. And that strikes us in a way, but, but this is how kings work. And everybody would agree that th this is certainly within the prerogative of the king. So he issues this decree that they're all to be killed. And Daniel's able to prevent that because God reveals to Daniel both the king's dream and its interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 47... He honors Daniel and he says, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then we go to chapter 3, and if I'm smart enough to work this. King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, I'll look over here. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, we're not told what or whom this statue represented, but scholars think it's unlikely that it's an image of Nebuchadnezzar himself. There's no evidence that statues of Mesopotamian rulers were worshipped as divine during the ruler's lifetime. And if you look in verses 12 and 14, they suggest that bowing down before the idol was a specific form of honoring Nebuchadnezzar's gods. So it's more likely what he's built is an image of one of the gods they worshipped. Perhaps it was Bel or Marduk or Nebo, also known as Nabu, these Babylonian gods. And you think, well, in 247, after what he just said about Daniel's God, you know, why is he forcing all of his subjects to worship an idol that he's built? Well, of course, polytheists would have no problem with worshiping many gods, and this particular god or gods of the images he's made may have been more closely associated with Babylonia. And I can see Nebuchadnezzar thinking, look, it's politically unwise for me to exalt a foreign god. I better get you know, plugged in with people to let them see that I'm down with Babylonian gods. So I can see him constructing this. Then we see in, in chapter 3, oh, 7 to 12. Did I miss part of that? Did I miss part of 3, 1 to 6? Yes, okay. I missed the, that part there where it says the satraps, prefects, governors, councils, they all gather together. And the herald in verse 4, the herald proclaimed aloud, You're, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound, the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you're to fall down and worship. You knew that. But I meant to read that, and I didn't. So then we get to 3, 7 to 12. He says, Therefore... As soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, I'm sure that, that many of those present thought that it was absolutely a crazy decision by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to not worship the image that the king had set up. I mean, these foreigners, they had status within the kingdom. They were high-level administrators. They were foreigners. And they'd been put into a position of high-level administrators. Nebuchadnezzar, he had honored them with positions of authority, and now they were defying him publicly by refusing to worship a Babylonian god. Can you just imagine the advice that they'd be receiving from their pagan friends? I'm sure they were being told in a hundred different ways that the prudent thing to do was to obey Nebuchadnezzar's command. And these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have made excuses, right? I mean, they could have rationalized bowing down before this image and, you know, come out, you know, soft pedaled it and gotten around it. There were ways they could have done that. They could have said, look, we're not really worshiping it. You know, we're just bowing down and offering praise with no heart behind it. It doesn't mean anything to us. This is just some kind of physical thing we're doing. That doesn't matter at all. After all, we know there's only one God. These things are meaningless, so it doesn't matter that we bow down and we praise this thing because our heart's not in it. Now, if, if Jews, they, they could have rationalized by saying, listen, if Jews, if we refuse to do this, and the Jews wind up being labeled as rebels or enemies of Babylon, it's going to make, make it much harder for us to persuade Babylonians to worship the true and living God. It's going to be counterproductive. The smart, wise thing to do in the long haul is for us to go ahead and bow down and do this. They could have told themselves, that, listen, surely the Lord does not want us killed. I mean, surely that's not what he intends. He's the author of life. And because, besides, we can do more good for God alive rather than dead, especially given the positions we have. We're in positions of power. Can you imagine all the good things we can do for God if we continue living in this position? So certainly God doesn't want us to die. They could have told themselves, look, the command against idolatry was not intended to cover a situation like this. I don't think the Lord meant that we are to refrain from idolatry to the point of suffering. He meant we should refrain from idolatry when it's reasonable to do so. After all, reason's a gift from God. And so I can see these guys having many ways of spinning this and convincing themselves and rationalizing why they should go ahead and do that. Now, of course, today we don't tend to bow down to statues, but there are all kinds of idols that vie for our devotion. There's money, power, status, fame, respect, happiness, ease, comfort, pleasure, and tranquility. All of these things compete for our allegiance. And we live among people who worship these things, who make these things the focus of their lives. And it's very easy to let one or more of those things slip onto the throne of our lives. I've told before the story when I was a young Christian. I hadn't been a Christian just a few months. 
and there was a fellow of elder visiting from somewhere, and he was talking at the congregation where I was, and afterwards, you know, God came out and said, yeah, you know, nice job and that kind of stuff. And when I was introduced to him, this was back in another life when I was an attorney, and he took too much note of that. I recognized when somebody introduced me and told him I was an attorney, he seemed to me to register. That seemed too important to him. Oh, and he came over. All right, so weeks go by, and he calls me at my office, and he says, uh, I got an idea for how you can make money for the church. I said, what is it? I can't tell you. He said, it'd be like giving a haircut over the telephone. <laughs> all right, so, you know, this guy's an elder. I said, all right. So he invites Meg and me over to his house. We go, he's got this huge thing, big family there. I mean, it looks like a Thanksgiving spread and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's one of these multi-level marketing things. And he begins this pitch that goes on for hours, and I'm ready to shoot myself. <laughs> but he's sitting here. He's sitting here. I'm not kidding you. And he asks me across this table, he says, do you like houses? And he slides this color brochure of these multi-million dollar homes at me. Do you like boats? I'm thinking, no, I don't like boats anyway. But he's, he's, got, he's got these pictures here, and he slides this catalog or this brochure of these, these you know, big, like, you know, uh, uh, Miami Vice type boats and all this kind of stuff. Cars? He's color, and, and I'm just looking at this guy going like, to me, it's like demonic. I just have this person who's just sitting here trying to say, give your soul to these things. Anyway, we left. Meg kindly took everything back they gave us the next day, and uh, that was the end of that. So those are the kinds of things you see that we have competing. Story goes on, 313 to 15. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? You have to understand the situation. This is the king. And this dude's word, you get on his bad side, and that's it for you. And so here these guys come. He has done them, we would say, a solid in putting them into administrative capacity, and they are now humiliating him, and he calls them in, and he says this to them. Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I've made, well and good. He's given them a chance. He says, well and good, but if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Uh-oh, he's throwing down. And who is the God who will deliver you? Do you know who I am? I'm Nebuchadnezzar. There's not a God anywhere, any place, who's going to deliver you when I decide you're toast. All right, I think this factors into uh, what's going on. But he tells him, he says, who's, who's the God who's going to deliver you out of my hands? Now, can you imagine being called to choose between obeying God and being burned to death? I mean, th th this, is, this is serious. Call, being ca called to choose between obeying God and being burned to death. If your child faced a gunman who told her to curse the Lord Jesus or die, would you prefer... What would, you, what would you prefer that she do? If your child said, no, I'm not going to do that, and, and gave up her life rather than curse the Lord Jesus, would you think that she had acted foolishly? That was crazy for her to do that. She should have just cursed Jesus and then gotten out of the situation. How would you think about that? If she accepted death for the sake of the Lord Jesus, how would you feel about it? Our culture certainly says, look, that a person would be crazy to do that. That's the message of our culture. If you did that, you would then be labeled a radical or a fanatic. You see, you're somebody who's taken faith and all that stuff way too far. If you, act, if you were somebody who did that. That's how our culture uh, views it. Now, you may recall back in August of 2006, there were two journalists from Fox News, Steve Santani and Olaf Wig, they were kidnapped in Gaza. And they were forced at gunpoint to profess conversion to Islam, and they were filmed reading the Koran in Arab robes as evidence of their conversion. And when they were released on August 27 of that year, 
The fact they'd been coerced into denying their Christian faith was thoroughly trivialized. That was seen as just absolutely nothing. The opening line of the New York Times story stated happily, two journalists kidnapped in Gaza were released unharmed today after being forced at gunpoint to say on a videotape that they had converted to Islam. Now, Christians throughout history have faced death for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're familiar with the persecution and suffering that's all over the New Testament. But let me read to you a section from Eusebius. If you've been in my classes, you've heard me read this before. But let me read to you a section from Eusebius, who's a Christian theologian and historian, who created, there were several editions of his book, History of the Church, but he completed it after, uh, after uh, Constantine became emperor in 325. Now, in the section that I'm going to read to you, He's speaking of the persecution in a region of Egypt that took place under the Roman Emperor Diocletian. And this was in the years 303 and 304, that period that is known as the Great Persecution. Now listen to what Eusebius says happened, he calls it the Thebes, it's a region of Egypt. He says, but words cannot describe the outrageous agonies endured by the martyrs in the Thebes. They were torn to bits from head to foot with potsherds like claws till death, that's broken pieces of pottery, with potsherds like claws till death released them. Women were tied by one foot and hoisted high in the air, head downwards, their bodies completely naked without a morsel of clothing, presenting thus the most shameful, brutal, and inhuman of all spectacles to everyone watching. Others again were tied to trees and the stumps and died horribly, for with the aid of machinery, they drew together the very stoutest boughs, fastened one of the martyr's legs to each, and then let the boughs fly back to their normal position. Thus they managed to tear apart the limbs of their victims in a moment. In this way, they carried on, not for a few days or weeks, but year after year, sometimes 10 or more, sometimes over 20 were put to death, at other times at least 30, and yet others not far short of 60, and there were occasions when on a single day, a 100 men as well as women and little children were killed, condemned to a succession of ever-changing punishments. I was in these places and saw many of the executions for myself. Some of the victims suffered death by beheading, others punishment by fire. So many were killed on a single day that the axe, blunted and worn out by the slaughter, was broken in pieces while the exhausted executioners had to be periodically relieved. All the time I observed a most wonderful eagerness and a truly divine power and enthusiasm in those who had put their trust in the Christ of God. No sooner had the first batch been sentenced than others from every side would jump onto the platform in front of the judge and proclaim themselves Christians. They paid no heed to torture in all its terrifying forms, but undaunted spoke boldly of their devotion to the God of the universe and with joy, laughter, and gaiety received the final sentence of death. They sang and sent up hymns of thanksgiving to the God of the universe till their very last breath. Now, I always think of these things and I say, you and I stand in a lineage like that. We stand on the shoulders of people who live for Jesus Christ. This is our heritage. This is who we are as a people. So let the world say, well, that's fanatic and that's crazy. But you see what happens here with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, fortunately, in this society... We're unlikely to be placed in a situation, a life and death situation over our faith. But there are still times, you see, when we have to choose between obeying the Lord and avoiding some suffering or hardship short of death. We have to choose these things. Obedience isn't always an easy road. I don't know where we'd ever got such an idea. It isn't always an easy road. Sometimes it's quite costly. 
Paul was well aware of that. Paul says in Philippians 1.20, I eagerly expect and hope he's in prison. I eagerly expect and hope I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. The thing that's important is that Christ be exalted in how I live and how I conduct myself, whether it means I die or not. What is important is how Christ is reflected and manifested in my life and glorified through it. Hebrews 10, 32 to 34. But recall the earlier days in which after having been enlightened, you endured a struggle of suffering, sometimes being made a public spectacle by both insults and afflictions and at other times being partners with the ones who were so treated. For indeed you sympathize with the prisoners and welcome with joy the seizing of your possessions, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and an enduring one. We see in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, John 21, verse 18 and 19. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, speaking to John, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, I'm sorry, speaking to Peter, right? Peter. Oh, all right. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. You see, obeying the Lord when it costs to do so. You see this, he says, this he said to show what kind of death he was, what kind of death he was to glorify God. You see, by what kind of death he was to glorify God. That was the effect of it. All right, no, 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 I have to be protected and put in a bubble. No, he says this is the kind of death by which he's to glorify God. Obeying the Lord when it costs you to do so. That's a testimony of the Lord's greatness. Right? When, it, when it, it's difficult to obey Him, when it costs you to obey Him, it says He's worth obeying despite that cost. You see, it glorifies God. The Lord is glorified. I mean, when, when obedience is easy, when, it, when it's something that doesn't hurt, and as soon as it becomes difficult, we sell... Well, what we're saying to the world is that our God is not worth the pain that caused us not to obey Him. That pain is worth more than Him. And that's not true. He's worth everything. He's worth everything. Husbands, is it hard to love your wife as Christ loves the church? Wives, is it hard to love, respect, and submit to your husband? Is it hard, difficult to honor the commitment you've made to your spouse before God and witnesses that you would never leave him or her till death do you part? Is it hard to serve your boss as serving the Lord? Is it hard to always tell the truth and to keep your word? Kids, is it hard to obey your parents? Is it hard not to be cool in a culture that defines as cool what is ungodly. Is it hard to forgive those who've mistreated you? Is it hard to love the unlovable, to love your enemies and not to attack those who attack you? See, difficulty in obeying is not grounds for disobeying. Rather, it's an opportunity to glorify God. Because in that you say, my God is worth anything. Isn't that hard to do? Yes, it's hard to do. But my God's worth it. My God is worth enduring that he might be glorified. I remember some years ago when Brother John was working at a company called Consigen. He was offered a job by Motorola doing just what he wanted to do at the time. He wanted to get into Oracle programming. And Motorola gave him that opportunity and was going to give him 10,000 more bucks a year. But they told him that they needed him to start in a week. And John said he had told his employer that he would give them two weeks notice. 
So he couldn't do that. He could start in two, but he couldn't start in one. So Motorola promptly hired somebody else. And uh, to add insult to injury, Consigen then laid John off three days later. So, carry on. 16 to 18. I'll pick that story back up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Now get that he says, and he will deliver us. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, the second part of 17 shows they knew that God was going to rescue them. That had apparently been revealed to them. And I'm guessing it was revealed when the king directly defied God. In verse 15, and when he says, what God's going to be able to get you out and rescue you from my hand? Okay, I, I got a hunch that they were then told, your God. Your God. Because they know. But the point is, they say in verse 18, it's very important because it reveals that God's supremacy is not in doubt. See, that question is closed. However God chooses to act. His supremacy is closed. And we need to remember that when God doesn't act the way we would like Him to act. You remember Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, where John the Baptist, after he's languishing in prison, he began to have second thoughts about whether Jesus was really the Messiah. See, he was suffering. He's expecting, he had a different expectation of what the Messiah's arrival meant. And as he languishes, and as the world continues to go on the way it is, he begins to wonder, what's up with this? Is there something that I've missed? And he sent disciples to ask him if he was in fact the promised one. And Jesus tells him, you go report back to John that he was fulfilling the Old Testament signs of the Messiah. And then in verse 6 he said, tell him something else. He says, tell him, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. He was saying that one is blessed who does not lose faith in him when he does not conform to their expectations. See, when he doesn't conform to their expectations, how they think he should act. They said, no, you have to hang loose because I'm sovereign. And so he tells them that. Now here in Daniel, what we see happening is 19 to 30. It says that Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it usually was heated and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was so urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm thinking their clothes caught on fire. And they burned. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the burning fire furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the, go prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hairs on their heads were not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. 
for there is no, no other God who's able to rescue in this way than the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Faithfulness is the path of blessing. You know, when you and I look at things, it doesn't always look that way. It looks like I'm sticking my head in a vice. But faithfulness to God is always the way to go. Always the way to go. Now, the rest of the story about Brother John is that he wound up getting a job as an oracle programmer, making more. Remember, Motorola was going to give him a $10,000 raise. He got a job as an oracle programmer with a $40,000 raise. And the Lord, you see, the Lord vindicated his faithfulness with a group of people he really enjoyed. And that job was then his springboard to his career at Honeywell, which he's been there for I don't know how long, 10 years, 12 years, 16. Time flies when you're having fun. Now, I'm not saying that that will always happen. The Lord will always do that in this life. You may suffer for your faith, and you may even be killed, but there is blessing beyond comprehension in store for the faithful of God. Let me finish with this text. I love this text. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. You can live your life You can live your life by what the Lord God reveals to us. He says, you can take this to the bank. I know how it looks sometimes, but you be faithful to me, and I will be faithful to you, and you will spend eternity in a mind-blowing reality that is complete bliss. It doesn't get any better than that. Now, the way we end these things is, if we can help you, we're going to sing a song You come up, let us know, however we can help. Thanks for coming.